Okay, welcome everyone to another Film Roundtable. My name is Matthew Wolf, and I'm very excited to welcome our panelists today. Uh, before I introduce them and get started uh, with the conversation, I just want to lead us through a moment of silence uh, to honor all the 4,947,056 reported worldwide COVID deaths as of today, October 24th, 2021. We'd also like to honour all of our black and brown brothers and sisters, as well as our First Nation brothers and sisters whose lives have been taken by the hands of police brutality and other senseless acts of violence. And uh, in light of the conversation today, uh, all other lives that have been needlessly lost through uh, things like addiction. So if you can please join me in a, in a brief pause, that'd be great, thank you. If I may, Matthew, I would like to add to that statement, uh, the sister and, and wonderful cinematographer, female cinematographer, Helena Hutchins, that uh, just was needlessly lost her life in a set, in a secure environment. Um, it's a senseless and no reason for that to happen ever on a set. So well, this is uh, to Halina. Thanks, Jacob, for bringing that up. I uh, just want to say how excited we are to have all these guys with us today. We have the creator, Danny Strong, the writer and creator of Dope Sick with us. Uh, Checo Varese, who's the cinematographer of, of Dope Sick. And um, I was going to say Francesca because your name's there. <laughs> I know it's my daughter. Sorry. <laughs> I was like, wait a second. <laughs> I'm I need to change it. I need to do this. Uh, Patricia, Patricia Regan, who directed episodes five and six uh, of Dope Sick, and we're excited because not only because uh, this is such a, uh, a hugely uh, topical conversation, but also just because from a film roundtable standpoint, to have a, the writer. Uh, the DP and one of the directors of the show with us and to kind of talk about that collaboration is something new for us. So we're, you know, we're, there's lots of great things that we're looking forward to, to hearing these guys talk. By the way, Danny also directed two episodes. So he's writer, director, producer, creator. And right. overall puppet muster. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Patricia, Checo. Uh, yeah, I did the last two. Did the last two. But Checo shot the whole series for Danny. So Checo shot eight episodes. I happily walked into two of them and then left. And then Danny and, and Checo had fun for like two more months without me. It wasn't, I mean, how could it be fun without you? <laughs> <laughs> That's not fun. And then we and then we had dinner a couple months ago, which was lovely. Mm -hmm. so that was the last time we uh we all saw each other. That's awesome. I mean, you know, like, let's, Danny, I want to start off with a question with you. Yeah, I know, you know, you've obviously written some shows before. You um, had huge success on many shows, especially with Empire. Uh, I believe this was, was this your solo, first solo outing as a show creator? Uh, cool? On TV, yeah. On TV. This was the first um, uh, TV show I created on my own and, and was the showrunner of. And and how was that experience? Was that was that a little bit daunting as it was the, your first outing? I mean, or hmm. you know, and did it go as you thought it would go? Or you know, I, I mean, I'm interested to hear. I didn't I didn't find it daunting. Um, I really liked it, to be honest with you. Um, I can't. I thought it was. I, I you know, I was really passionate about the subject matter. I thought that it was uh a, a, a potentially really exciting explosive piece and i liked um overseeing the whole thing uh not just the writing part but then production as well i was there for every day of production so uh and there's one of the things i like the most about this job when i'm in this position you know i've been in this position on empire as the co-creator with a showrunner attached um, and then there was another TV show I worked on and I directed a film. So I've, I've, 
I've done this in different capacities, but what, what I like about it when I'm in charge of it or in co-charge of it is I just like being um, the coach of a whole group of artists. I find that I really enjoy that process. I really enjoy having all these incredibly talented people, these designers, a cinematographer, all these actors, and sort of leading the charge of that group. I don't really view myself as um, as the boss uh, or that it's quote my vision. You know, a lot of people on set they view it as sort of everything is an extension of of them. I guess to a certain extent. And for me, I view it as um, all these incredibly talented people. I mean, your 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 cinematographer, your production designer. I mean, what they went through to get to the point that they're getting hired on something of a, of a huge budget. It's, it's, it's like the elite of the elite of the elite. And I find it uh, just really exciting to be around all these extremely creative people. And my goal is when I'm in charge is to just try to make everyone feel empowered, uh, to make them feel loose, to make them feel like they're having a good time and that we're sort of all in this together to have a positive creative experience uh, so that the work can be the best work it could be, but also so that this time spent doing this uh, is time well spent. You know, I don't think being on a set needs to be a torturous experience. I think it's hard enough uh, achieving what you need to achieve every day on a set under the best of circumstances. I, it's, so, it's so difficult for everyone. Um, so if you can infuse that with um, a sense of uh, everyone's there to bring their artistry to it, uh, I think that you get the, the best out of people. And I think that they in turn have um, a better experience and I in turn have a better experience. So that's, that's sort of my overall philosophy when I'm, when I'm on, uh, on set uh, as either the showrunner or the, the director. Which is what makes you a great boss, Danny, because you do let people be and you're not micromanaging and you are always there for anything that is needed in terms of creative, you know, answers, um, but just makes it really, really fun and relaxing to work with you. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. And that's why I hire people that are going to embrace that spirit. Um, and also that I think are really talented. So, so Checo and Patricia are perfect uh, collaborators for me uh, because they're incredibly talented uh, and, and just a lot of fun uh, to work with. And we've had now a few, I guess two, we've had two uh, really successful collaborations. I hope successful. Actually, I kind of know it now. The show's doing great. <laughs> so I can say that now. <laughs> we, have a, we have a very successful show here. So, um, um, but uh, yeah. That's that's the uh, sort of guiding philosophy yeah. that I have, at least. That's Matthew, we, we met um, the three of us in another show that Danny um, wrote and um, for Fox. Yeah, well, I produced it. I, I wasn't the creator of that one, but I was the, the EP and I kind of supervised it. Yeah. And he hired me to direct the pilot and I brought Checo in. And we she had no choice. She had no choice. We we were, mar <laughs> we're married. I do have choices. I have choices. <laughs> wasn't, that um, one of your, wasn't that one of your wedding vows? It's like, you know, no. wherever you go, you take Checo with you. No, no, no. <laughs> but, you know, I have to say that. And I don't know if Checo or Danny have said this to anybody. But, you know, when Danny invited me to come back in Dope Sick, we were taught, I was, you know, super happy. This is so important, such an important story to tell. Um, and then he mentioned that um, he didn't have a DP yet because uh, Barry Levinson didn't really like anybody that was presented to him. And I say, well, you know, Czech was available. And he's like, is he available? And then like, he probably like quickly like sent text and emails. And I believe sent um, Barry Levinson Czech's resume and immediately Barry said, yes, I want to meet him. So it was really cool that um, then, you know, Barry and Checo met and then he liked Checo and took him. And I thought, oh my God, I'm going to get to work with my DP in, uh, in Dope Sick. 
Well, you know, it was it was a step further. It wasn't even Checo's resume. It was a Checo's reel. And there had been many a reel that had come before Barry that had been dismissed. You know, Barry just had the highest bar for cinematographers, which would make perfect sense because he's Barry Levinson. You know, I mean, he's got 40 years of, of iconic American classics. Uh, and so I, as soon as uh, uh, Patricia told me that he was available, uh, I, you know, quickly sent his reel over to Barry, but I tried to play it cool. I didn't want to, I, I just didn't want him to think it was an inside job situation, you know, that it was just sort of a clean, oh, here's a DP I worked with that I liked. Uh, take a look, you know, that sort of thing. And, uh, and he, he emailed me back immediately. He's like, I love him. This is great. So I was so happy because I really just wanted to do it with Checo as soon as I found out he was available. So it was this, it was just a huge thumbs up from Barry. And it was uh, probably the, the, the hardest thing uh, on the whole production to get thumbs up from Barry on what was on cinematographers. I mean, it was, it was, he just had a very, very high bar which I, I totally got. I mean, I was thrilled he had such a high bar because I want a great cinematographer on the show. So yeah, it was, it was terrific when, uh, when he instantly wanted to meet with Checo. And then we did, I think a few days later, and it was, uh, it was a fantastic meeting. And, and uh, for anyone who hasn't seen the show, um, the look of the show is incredible. Uh, Checo did a, an incredible job on the piece. And it's a really sort of, um, you know, secret sauce, although not really secret, uh, part of what helps make the piece so powerful and propulsive at times and depth uh, in, in the, the personal relationships. You know, it's, it's a multi-faceted tonal piece. You know, we're not, I'm not just doing a thriller or I'm not just doing an addiction drama. It's, it's sort of four different types of pieces rolled into one. And one of the things that is a challenge or an obstacle or something you have to overcome is that it doesn't visually feel like four different stories, is that, is that you've got these four different tones um, and, and four different sort of genres all coming together as one cohesive piece. And Checo was a huge part of, of making that all happen. Mm -hmm. And one thing I, I have to say, that's not very usual is that they hired one cinematographer for the whole you know series and that made it very special because he's there the whole time but it also made it very hard for Checo physically emotionally you know it was a hard show um because he had no rest ever and uh well, so but the rest is over <laughs> overrated Overrated in yeah. um, Christmas. <laughs> Christmas is coming, so I'll sleep between the twenty fourth and the twenty fifth. <laughs> and it was one, brutal because we were in COVID too. So anyway, one of the things that I I have to say is that thank you, Daniel and Patricia, for all the words. But <clears throat> I learned that early on in my career, through through being surrounded by filmmakers, is that the most important thing is the story, and is the script, and the script is what really drives a story. And if it's not on the page, I don't know how to photograph it. You know, if, if, if I don't see it or I don't feel it, I don't, I don't know. And, and in the script, it was, I wouldn't say obvious, but it was bland and what the story was about and what every point was. And one of the things that Danny brought very early on, and I thought it was brilliant and, and, and Barry too, is that, this is a peaceful town and Godzilla is about to attack it. This is a peaceful town and Pennywise is coming and killing everyone. This is a peaceful town and Oxycontin is arriving. So that is your horror story. That is your nemesis. That is the antagonist. And it was such a clear message. We had this beautiful... I don't call them establishing, nor Daniel or Patricia calls them, but it's this beautiful tableau of this bucolic little town with the snow falling, and you see a church, and in the background you see a family coming, and it's the ever so slightly camera push, as if something dangerous is coming. And that was, for me, such a pleasure to find those little nuances, those little commas in the phrase of a camera, those little accents, those little... 
accents in the languages we have accents you guys don't have accents but thank you. <laughs> but those accents that gave the camera a purpose and they the camera a meaning and gave the audience curiosity it, this is a show with a curious camera it's a camera that actually doesn't show you everything the actors don't say everything they just say a few words and you always feel curious about it and i always felt curious on on leave leave a question mark at the end of every shot you know so you so you are hungry for for more visuals for more information for more words for more tears for more smiles even if there are a few only but for more triumphs you know and to me that was the driving force how can i make the audience curious how can i make the audience hungry and uh, Danny gave me carte blanche, Barry and Michael Cuesta, our other director, and Patricia. And Danny, on the last two episodes, there was always a question mark. How can I make this better? How can I make the audience more hungry? Uh, because there are, no, there are no answers in life. You know, there, there is never an answer. There is more questions. You know, and the more questions you pose, the more answers, hopefully, you get. And, and sometimes just it happens or it doesn't. But if you, don't ask, if, you don't, if you don't ask questions, then you, how can you find an answer? So to me, Dopsy was that. It's a bag full of questions, you know, and very hard questions to answer. And Matthew, it just- I don't know, it makes sense. <laughs> what were you gonna say, Patricia? Just occurred to me, are you gonna tell the audience what we're talking about before we start, or Danny should say what Dope Sick is about, because we kind of, we're we already kind of, getting into all the, you know, little things about this show, but maybe we haven't talked about what it, the show. For sure, for sure, we kind of jumped it, we jumped ahead a little bit, just um, just the way the conversation went. I didn't want to interrupt the flow. Um, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it, or we could let Danny sum it up, uh, whichever way. Um, oh, you can go ahead. Um, so basically, um, uh, Dope Sick is a, is a, a limited, an eight part se limited series uh, on the Oxycontin crisis, the opioid crisis and how it affected um, America. Um, and it, it's, take, it's told from um, a, a couple of different stories. Uh, you, have the, you have the story part, uh, without wanting to give anything away, uh, which I'll try not to. Um, you have the story uh, about Purdue Pharma, that was the company that manufactured Oxycontin, uh, which I have to say, I didn't know that they were based in Stanford, Connecticut, and I live just down the road. So I, I, I now I can't drive into Stanford without feeling uneasy. And I, I probably since since I've watched the show, you know, I've probably driven past the building probably, I don't know, a half dozen times. So I never thought about it before. And now I drive past it. Uh, and uh, even with my kids in the car, and I think, oh my goodness. So, so um, um, but uh, so yeah, that, so Purdue Pharma. There's the story about about them, uh, who, like I said, who manufactured the the the, the drug. Then you've got the Sackler family, who uh, own the large majority shareholders of Purdue Pharma. Then you have um, Michael Keaton's character, Doctor Phoenix, who was a story of one character, one doctor rather, one of millions of doctors or thousands of doctors who dispensed oxycontin and how it affected his life and then uh, well there's so many different characters but um uh no, you're doing it's, great it's a whole ensemble really i mean a wonderful and, and then two investigations, the, two of, investigations. Um, the u.s attorney's office in western virginia that was bringing a case against purdue pharma and a dea agent yeah. who was trying to stop purdue pharma so those are uh, the four storylines uh, all intertwined as well but well done <laughs> <laughs> it's it's uh, one played by like the most amazing actors that uh, you can yeah, ever yes. wish for that, you know, that Danny and, and the material, you know, were able to, to bring in into this show, all of them, just act absolutely top actors doing all these roles. Just Yeah, yeah, we were very blessed. They were just incredible uh, cast. How do, you, how do you go about creating the team like, you know, pick the right directors and, you know, and, you know, and, and, and decide which episodes you guys are going to direct, you know, um, and, you know, and then how much, how much do you, and I'm asking multiple questions here, but, and then how much do you, you know, you know, do you get, 
sit sit down with Chaco and the cinematographer and 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 have chance to kind of really plan out all the episodes to kind of really help tell that story. So answer all of those questions in the next five seconds, please. All right. Uh, yes. <laughs> no, no. Okay. Yes. Now, um, so as far as hiring the directors, well, Barry was going to direct the first two, and I knew I was going to direct the last two. So there was half the season there. Right. Uh, uh, so then it was a matter of um, filling the other two slots. And Patricia was my first idea. Uh, so we went to her. I, you know, I just instantly knew I wanted her um, to, to do it. And, um, and then I actually <clears throat> uh, also went to uh, my friend, Senna Homry, who was our producing director on Empire. And, um, um, and they both said yes. So I had, you know, these two killer directors. Uh, I had Barry Levinson, who's an icon. And then I had the least experienced director of the group, which was me. Uh, but I was like, well, I got Moxie uh, and I got a heart full of dreams. So I thought I could, you know, I was going to be able to pull it off. And then Senna had to drop out at the last second, you know, and it was actually no fault of hers. It was this very frustrating situation um, that involved a project I was involved with, actually. So, so we, we, we lost Senna and had to replace her pretty quickly. Um, and so that was pretty scary because we had six weeks to find someone who would direct two episodes with this very unusual block shooting situation because we block shot all of Michael Keaton's episodes at once which added a whole level of complexity in an already wildly complex situation, which was shooting this show in the pandemic. Um, and then Michael Cuesta was available. And I didn't think at first, I just wasn't sure we'd get him because he's a big pilot director and a big feature director. But then Patricia said yes, and she's a big pilot director and a big feature director. So it was sort of like, well, maybe the material is sort of overriding the fact that, that there are people that really don't do episodic that often that would be willing to do it. So, so he, he said yes, um, which was amazing because we had, you know, was, we had to hire someone really, really fast. Uh, so that's how I ended up with the, with the team. Um, and then as far as the overall look of the piece and the feel and the tone. I mean, those were discussions that Checo and Barry and myself that the three of us had very early on in the process. Um, Checo very wisely said, I think that the insider could be a really good sort of tonal, tonal template for us, something to look at. And uh, I totally agreed. I mean, that's kind of our show a little bit is the insider that certainly has a lot of that. Barry was really uh, really loved the idea of the town feeling like the deer hunter. Uh, so we talked about, you know, the deer hunter conceptually as a, from a structural point of view. One of my inspirations was traffic. So these were different things that we were talking about uh, in those early stages. We, we were so lucky to have an incredible production designer, Neil Spizik, who was a huge feature production designer, did heat, right? Did all of... Uh, all of Sam Raimi's Spider-Man movies. I mean, just the, the breadth of his career and his credits are just staggering. And the fact that, and he'd done very little television. He'd done a few pilots, I think. So the fact that he was open and then wanting to do the job, it was, it was just a huge coup for us. So he obviously was heavily involved in, in these discussions as well, as far as, as far as the look of the show. So it was, I, I had a basic kind of arc for the season of of how of of sort of the flow of the season which I talked about with Checo in, in basically a five minute conversation you know I was like the first two episodes it's it's act one it's a 70s horror film it's it's something's coming for them and that something's oxycontin then when we get into three and four uh the monster arrives and and three, it's it starts to get crazy, and then four. Now the monster is here, and it's destroying things. Uh, and then five and six is uh, our investigators coming in 
trying to stop the monster, trying to bring justice to to what is what is occurring, even though they've been, of course, doing it throughout the season. But that's when that sort of the middle of act two section of it and then seven and eight. Um, seven and eight were, were uh, you know, actually I kind of don't want to say for people who haven't seen the show yet, because it kind of gives stuff away. But but I had a real clear arc to to how this went and um, and, uh, and and how the show escalated, you know, where the escalations began tonally uh, with the energy of the piece uh, and then and then how what would happen, how the tone shift occurs in the last two episodes, particularly the last episode, I, I structured this like a movie to me that, it, that, it, that the eight episodes has a three act structure to eight episodes. Not each episode doesn't have a three act structure, but the totality of it does with the last episode being act three of a movie. So it, that, that has its own kind of energy to it and feel to it. And I think that the, the escalation and the, the sort of shift in changing tones, not just what I was talking about with the different storylines, but the macro changing tones of the piece on the whole. And I don't know if changing is the right word, maybe escalation uh, and shifting. Um, you know, that was just something that was, that was uh, um, a, 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 you know, completely constructed from the writing stage and my discussions with Checo and then Patricia for her episodes um, it, it was, it, you know, and, and Michael Cuesta as well was all just part of the discussion, but they weren't, these discussions weren't hour long discussions where we went to the woods and meditated and, and then, you know, danced right to, to, for, for it to work out. It was literally just a pretty fast. Yeah, this is this, this is, this is this. And Checo's response was, yep, yep. Got it. Yep. That, that's what I thought. Yep. You know, it, it was that kind of, of shorthand. Uh, and then same with, with Patricia. I mean, she just, she told me what it was, you know, I was like, yeah, that's right. That, that's what I was up to. So um, that's kind of how we, uh, how we did this, how we put it together. Well, but also um, having the luxury of having Danny, other than the two times you had to go to the bathroom, which I regret. Yeah, which I regret. <laughs> was very far. Um, every time I was starting a scene, I would go like, so you read the script, you read the sides, and you go, where are we? What is this? I mean, where are we? So I will run to Danny. I said, where are we? And he would immediately say, well, we're here and this is what's happening. Okay, I got it. You know, because you can interpret anything, but it's not, the problem is not the now. The problem is the yesterday and tomorrow. Because to portray the now in a way that makes sense, you have to know what happened yesterday and you have to know what happened tomorrow. And that's a privilege I don't have. But it's a privilege that if having Danny there, then he knew what was happening yesterday and two weeks ago, and he knows what is going to happen in five months. You know, Patricia is the same. I'm like, what is this about? And if she goes, oh, haven't you read the script? And I'm like, yes, but I don't mm -hmm. see it. And, and having answers, direct answers of where the characters are, where the story is, allows you to be free from preconceptions. You know, oh, that's what it was. Now I got it. You know, so that is, and I, Patricia was saying it was very hard for the eight episodes, and I do agree. But it's not about ownership. It's not about, it's not about that or, or imprint. It's about the arc of the story I can design in a way like an eight hour movie. You know, it's, it's like a movie. It's, it's a movie I was working on. So, so you, you design every shot with the collaboration of fantastic operators and, and everybody, but you design every shot and you're, you know what's gonna happen. You call the editor and you say, sorry, am I too tight? Am I too wide? Am I, am I doing fine? And the editor will come back to you and say, no, 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 it's great. I would love some different things here and there because I think it will help. So it's a collaboration, it's everyone, you know, but having the luxury of having Danny there answering the question is like, oh, now I got it. Yeah, I have to say that, you know, it, it, I think it was very special that we didn't have any producer. We only had Danny. That is actually a really wonderful thing. We had the luxury of having Danny the entire time. And because Danny is, is the way he is, which is a person that, that wants you to bring your artistry, it's a real luxury to have him there because you can do everything you want. And at the same time, you have that, you know, that person that knows it all 
and we'll, you know, be able to answer any question and we'll get you out of trouble if you get in trouble. And we'll always be there making sure everything is great, but not really stepping in if it's great, you know, which is not the normal thing for us, you know, directors in television and in movies too, you know, where you have like a plethora of uh, people um, with opinions, you know? So that's why I think it's such a strong show because it comes from that one person that has the vision and the talent and also the, the really wonderful way of working. It was a luxury to have Danny around, which I never would say about a producer, you know, like, <laughs> With all respect to all the great producers out there, but it, it you know, you know what I mean. Very, sure. yeah. Yeah, very disconnected, huh? Yeah, Checo left us. Did he quit? No, I moved. Oh, there he is. There he I, is. I went there and closed the door because the dog is barking outside, so I didn't want you to see <laughs> doing some I think, I think you can hear the, Sorry, you can hear the dog more than we can, I think, but yeah. uh. It's like that with my kids of like, can I, you know, can everyone hear them? Um, you know, actually, Patricia, what, well, you know, you know, you're hearing you talk, I, what's it like? What's it like coming in as a director on a TV series? I mean, obviously you've directed movies, you know, um, you know, but coming in as a director on a TV series where you're, you know, you're directing two of the later episodes. Um, now you have to kind of fit into, to, uh, to a style and, you know, to a rhythm and, you know, and keep consistency of performances, which have already been established, you know, is that, is that, is that a different skill? Um, yeah. And, completely, and how hard is it? Yeah. Completely different skill. Um, but you kind of, you know, as you know, you just take it and say, this is what I'm here for. And I'm going to lend my tool set, you know, and, and my experience in artistry, to bring this the vision of this gentleman in this case, you know, to life. And I'm gonna, you know, follow and, you know, because that's why it's so important to work with people that you like and that you have the same taste. And Danny and I tried before, you know, in the pilot and realized we're, we're on the same page. We have really, really same taste and wow. uh, ideas. So um, it's made, it's very easy in that sense, you know, if it was not the case, it would be very hard. And I come from movies, so I'm used to me having my, my way, you know, so it does have to, you, you, you do have to change the, the, the chip inside. Uh, but if you're working with people that have talent, it's very easy. And it's actually very convenient, I, as I was saying, because you also know that there's that person there who is, um, overseeing everything and making sure that everything um, is right. And I say this because I'm very aware that I'm coming in to direct a slice of the cake, right? But the cake has a shape and a form and, a, and, and, and everything. And I want to make sure that the, the slice of the cake fits perfectly into the cake. And how do I do that? I, I turn to Danny. So sometimes, you know, I would just turn to Danny and ask the question, you know, where is this uh, you know, character, you know, where is she coming, you know, things that I don't know, because I don't know the, the beginning and the end um, of what they've been doing. And he would answer the question. So, you know, if you, if I think it's a, it's a completely different skill set to do episodic directing, but if you do it with the right people, it's, it's cool and it's fun. That's great. And this, this is a unique thing too, in that it's, it's a limited series, right? So that's why I was there for every shot, because I could be. If it was an ongoing, I can't be there for every shot because the show's got to live without me there on set 24-7. I got to be able to feel like by episode four, it can work without me. Or how is this going to go on for however many years? I mean, it's a challenging, it's, it, you know, every, every project has its own challenges, which is also why I was so careful in in hiring the directors I hired and why Patricia was my first choice out of the gate was because when we did that pilot together um we it, it was I remember our first casting session together where every note that popped in my head to give the actor which I wasn't going to give um because it's their audition but I but you know, and because Patricia was sitting there next to me, right? And I'm not going to just step in and, and, and step on her toes. But but nonetheless, you know, these thoughts do pop into my head. I'm also a director. And literally every time something popped into my head, 
I wouldn't even have to turn to her. She would just turn to the actor and say exactly what was in my head. And I was like, okay, so we just have the same taste. We have the same taste in performance. Uh, we liked all the same actors. It was very, it was, it was just a very simpatico mindset. Um, and at one point I had talked to Hulu about Patricia directing the entire half of the season. You know, that's how much confidence I had in her. Uh, was was Barry would do the first two, I would do the last two, and Patricia would do the whole middle section of the show. Uh, so, so you know, I think that should show you, you know, how, how much I trust her. And, and I think trust is the key word that I know that if I leave said, if I'm not there, um, I just know that I'm in great hands with her. So it was, and, and that's how it was uh, on the shoot. And, and kind of the only times I would really chime in is if something was was just off, uh, which was not very often. And so because I would chime in, I'd be like, no, no, this, this is, it was usually in rehearsal. You know, it, it would be like, actually, this isn't this isn't what it what it needs to be. It needs to be this. And Patricia would be like, oh, great. You know, I mean, that's how easy it was. And that probably happened, what, you know, three times in two episodes. So it was it wasn't like it was constantly happening either. But I don't want to I, I don't want to micromanage the directors, because I think a that's a bad time for them, and they're really if I if if they're here they're really talented people, right? So it's it's not about them doing everything that I may have in my head. They may they may add other things to it that I would never think of that go beyond what I was thinking. I mean that's the whole point of collaboration and and having someone there. And it's the same thing with Checo too. I mean it's it's just. It's it's uh it's not about and the actors. I mean, you know, I think when people try to micromanage the directors, often writers that direct, they try to micromanage the actors in a way where they want the line said exactly as they hear it in their brain, and I think that is just a recipe for disaster. Um, I think that it's now in the actor's hand. It's now a new piece. Let them. Let them bring their own interpretation to it. And if that needs to be adjusted, sure. But if you want to micro, if you want to give them line readings on every single line, uh, I think that um, I think that you're gonna lose the spirit of what happens when actors are just playing uh, and, and, and what can come of a looseness and a freedom that that has a, a, a reality to it, you know, an emotional reality, which to me is the most exciting stuff. You know, I'm not in love with my words. Uh, I don't mind when actors tweak things or I, I like improvisation here and there. Um, sometimes I don't mind just doing a pure a scene that's just purely improvised, you know, or you know what, let's just start overlapping each other because it feels really fake to me. <laughs> right. You guys are fighting. So so just overlap, you know, and the sound guy comes over and this is a disaster. You know, it's like, yes, never in the history of film have people overlapped. Right. So it's it's uh, just just go, just go. Uh, and that's to me the most exciting part of the job is when it becomes this this new thing when you're on set, and and that's where I kind of started with with artists, you know, bringing all these high level artists together to come figure something out. I think that's when uh, that's when really it starts to kind of cook in a, in a pretty dynamic way. I was going to tell you that it's exactly like I direct actors, right? Like we have to direct actors. This is how, how you do it. You don't say anything. That's how you direct them. You just let them do it because if you open your mouth before they do it, you can crush something that was going to be awesome and you will never know because you already put something else in their heads. So you just need to shut up and wait. And then once they do it, you can build from that. And I think that's, you know, the beauty of working with Danny is that, that he allows for that. The beauty of working with actors is, is that. Um, and then you can always chime in, but let the people do their thing because that's yeah. why they, you hire them. Yeah, and I feel the same way. That's exactly my approach. And it started from, um, from me being as an actor, my first, I remember my first two, just some early jobs where a director I had a very, would have very small parts and they would over direct me before I've even shot a take. And, mm -hmm. and it would get in my head and now wow. I'm trying to make Never. them happy as opposed to doing the scene. And then finally, when I get to something that they were happy with, I was like, oh, well, that's what I would have done had you not said anything to me in the first yeah. place. Right? That's so, the thing. Don't yeah. say anything. Shut up. And, you know, sometimes I'm like approaching the actor. I'm like, mm, hold it. 
go back, wait, you know, don't say anything. Um, Danny's a great actor, by the way. I don't know if you know Matthew, but he's he has another life. I, I saw I saw that you started as an actor. Uh, it was actually going to be one of my questions, like, you know, making that change, you know, get, starting from the acting side of things, you know, and coming, coming around. I mean, do, do you do you still act or you know, would you still act? Uh, I think I think. Uh, yeah, well, I, I, I was going to try to say something funny, but it was going to it just didn't come out right. So I kept it to myself. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I do still act. I don't pursue it, uh, but I've been on the TV show Billions for the last five years and and. Uh, you know, I've been doing lots of TV shows and, and occasional films, but I, it's not something I pursue anymore. It's more of uh, stuff, just occasionally someone thinks of me for something. And, uh, and if it's interesting to me and I'm available, then, then I'll do it. And sometimes I think of me for things and it's not interesting to me and then I don't do it. So it's, it's, I have so much more fun now as an actor than I ever did when it was my livelihood for 15 years, because I'm so much looser now. It's, it's really just, it's a much more artistic experience uh, than it ever was before. And I did quit for a few years uh, and I never had more joy than those first two years I quit acting. Uh, it was literally, I can't begin to tell you how happy I was. Uh, and then, but then people kind of just would keep calling because I was on a few iconic shows that people knew me from. And then, and then I did Mad Men and then that led to other things too. So it was, it's something that, that I, I still enjoy doing and, uh, and yeah, I love doing Billions. It is so much fun. It's such a great show. But um, but but that experience of being an actor is everything as far as me as a writer, as a producer, as a director. It's literally it's literally everything. It's my whole secret weapon. And so occasionally I'll read something, you know, less so. I, it hasn't happened on Dope Sick, to be honest with you. But for years, when people were to try to discredit me, something I was doing with a project, they would always bring up the acting first, you know, the actor from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the actor from Gilmore Girls. If that, as if that immediately makes me, you know, irrelevant and, and, and uh, you know, um, you know, not worthy of, of the job I'm doing now. But um, I, I always thought it was ridiculous. It never bothered me once. I just thought, wow, you really don't know um, what you're uh, writing about here because the, that experience is, is, literally my biggest asset as far as every element of, of what I do now. I think it's, yeah, it's so important that, you know, it makes us such a, the more experiences we have, the more of a rounded filmmakers we are. You know, you could say that about life too, essentially, right? I wanna, I want you to ask us about shooting during COVID because I think this is a, something that makes this show very special, very unique. And hopefully there won't be another era like that one. But we had the, you know, um, the, I guess the, 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 the luxury um, uh, or the, of shooting were being one of the first shows that um, got on its feet during the pandemic before the vaccines. Um, but it, it made everything really scary, very difficult. We were living in danger, you know, it really had it really injected, you know, something um, to all of us about the importance of telling this story and, 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 you know, and going through the difficulties and the challenges that, that uh, COVID was presenting and still going forward. We believed in the story so much um, that we did it. And I don't think, you know, I, I shot a movie in the mine right in a real mind for 30 days that was very hard but this was as hard this was really hard we didn't know um how to nobody knew how to take care of themselves everything was a little exploration of how do we keep safe it was very rigid the rules were very strict um and tons of them we had masks and shields the actors had masks and shields we were never allowed to remove the shield or the mask. The actors would remove the mask on take. We couldn't rehearse without the mask. At all times, there was this blast of very loud air conditioning through the set, which made it impossible to hear each other. So not seeing our faces, not being able to stand close to an actor and whisper 
the idea, the direction, the adjustment, you know, it's something that is, uh, that, that made it very, very challenging. Um, and, uh, and we did it, but I, I wanted to mention that because it was brutal. No, I'm glad you brought it up. It was, it was on my list. I mean, I, I've been shooting, you know, during COVID myself, uh, I started back up in production in, in July last year. And, um, um, actually, Chaco, how did COVID affect you? I will start with that uh, and make it more difficult for, for the challenges you were facing. And, and then the other thing I wanted to ask you, you know, and I know, you know, all the different t- periods, time periods that you guys had in the show. And you, you know, Danny used this great effect with the, the roving, the rolling date change. But, for, you know, was there a different approach in the cinematography to kind of help tell that story too? So to to go back to COVID for a second, um, we had a very strict, we had very strict protocols, but I have to say out of a crew of 120, I guess, 130, 100, multiply 120 for 93 days of shooting, I believe it was. 104 Um, or five. What? 104 or five. Yeah, 100 and so 120, that's. 1,200 men days, yeah? No, 12,000 men days, sorry, 12,000 men days. Out of those 12,000 men days, we had one close call, but it was somebody's cousin. We had somebody in the art department, but far away, like the buyer in the, like three levels away from us. We were all so proud and so careful and so emotionally involved with the fact that we were working, that we were beating the pandemic, that we will beat Purdue Pharma, that we will beat the monster, that we will honor all these people that lost their lives or are losing their lives. It was almost like being a, a, a militant in some organization that you need to push forward. And uh, yes, it was complex. You You start to learn how to read people's faces by literally this. Oh, he's curious. Oh, he's happy. Oh, he's sleepy. You know, that's the amount of information you get. Maybe sometimes a little body language, but we were like freaking Virginia in winter, so no body language. We all looked like the Michelin man freezing. So there was nothing. And you start reading those and you start eliminating jokes because jokes is about your face. So you don't say jokes anymore because how are they going to take them? So it took a lot of effort, but uh, we were very safe. We were kept very safe because we were all serious about it. Um, To answer the later part of the question, thank God Danny devised this spinning bait because the problem when you're doing a back in time and the time expand is not that much you know it's 1980 something to 1990 something to 2000 and something so it's 20 years 15 years 16 years so the only difference is do i have an iphone 12 or do i have a flip phone phone everything else seems to be more or less the same and the tie and the jacket yeah you have to be an art director uh, sorry a wardrobe person to understand that this ties is from the 80s and that ties is from the 90s so it were very subtle changes and early on Danny and I and, and, and Barry talked about do we change the look and the question was answered by itself no you don't because then it's more confusing for the audience you change maybe camera language in the arc of the story I, I always saw the story Danny thought about mentioned about four story I always saw it like the, the, the Olympic circles, you know, the, there are three circles that interject themselves in the middle, like three circles with a little something in the middle. And that something is the Oxycontin pill. You know, there is the circle of the victims, the, the Dr. Phoenix, the, the minors, the, the young girl that got addicted because she had an accident. And that's the victims and the circle of the civil servants, the circle of the people that try to solve the case. And that circle is in the middle. And then the other circle that is the, the, the Purdue and the corruption of, of greed and, and capitalism at its most wild uh, example of like the only thing that matters is the dollar sign. You know, it's like in this 
could be the story of the oil producers. This could be the story of the cigarette makers. This could be the story of, of Monsanto and, and, and the genetically modified corn. It's the story of you taking care of your shareholders as opposed to taking care of humanity. And, and those intersect and in a way that time really didn't matter much. We didn't change the lighting or the lighting approach to it because it would have been, it's, you jump from one time to the next one and it would have been sort of confusing uh, in my mind. And, and, and Dan and Barry, we sort of agree that there are subtle changes in winter and seasons. You know, there are subtle changes in uh, the, the Purdue Pharma is gold and warm and, and aspirational and all these people are very good, but with like a, a shadow on their face or like the camera is too low or too high because you want to sort of foreshadow something for the audience. And this young little girl, Caitlin Deaver, I cannot say any, I cannot say how wonderful she is. This young girl, minor, she lives in this cold place, but yet the warmth, the warmth of the family and the color of the house. So those were the nuances. Uh, we didn't apply anything to the time period because again, I'm repeating myself. I thought it would have been confusing a little bit. I, I have a very simple thought too, which was, you know, traffic did that where they had different color schemes for each story. And I thought for two hours, it's really cool. For eight hours, it might just be too much. Yeah, that, I mean, it was, there was some kind of just a simple thought there of, of eight hours of constantly changing the colors the way traffic did. And I love traffic and it was a you know, huge inspiration for this. I just, I don't know. I was just concerned over eight hours. It would, it would get too stylized. Um, so that was another, another thing, yeah. but, but it was more, you know, what Cheka was just saying, it was more subtle adjustments in, in color correction uh, was the only place where, where, you know, we, the investigators, it was a little cooler. And um, what he was talking about with the richness of the Purdue world uh, and, and there's slight desaturation in the mining world. Um, so, so it was, it was, it was very subtle, um, all designed by, by Checo um, and Barry was heavily involved too. And, and uh, uh, I thought it was, it was really, uh, really well done. Uh, in, in post and, you know, Stefan, our, our color, you know, cor correctionist is one of the best in the business, if not the best. So we, we had all these MVPs on the show. Mm -hmm. Right. There was, um, that, I mean, just to, just to talk about a macro or a micro level, just for a second, I don't, I don't know if you remember it, but, um, uh, and I'm trying not to give anything away. There's a, there's a scene where the, the, the two FBI uh, sorry, the, the attorney general investigators, prosecutors, uh, the, prosecutors. Sorry, they, they they lose one of their witnesses, um, and I won't say why. And uh, you know the scene that you know it's in the hospital and it's very warm. You know, they're sorry, and they walk out into the waiting room and they're like, you know, they realize that you know that they they've lost they've lost this witness that they were hoping to to move ahead with. And and it's in a very warm scene in the in the hospital, and then that you cut to them the two same same two characters, and they're in you know, in this dining, this uh, diner and, uh, you know, the ceiling you, in, the, in the hospital, you've got this warm circular lights. And then in the diner, you've got this, it's very cool, you know, and there's lots of like angular neon lights. And it's, you know, it's very, there's a huge contrast of like, you know, the bad news, the warm, this warm to this cool. And, you know, I don't know if I'm overthinking it, but, you know, I was interested to know, you know, things like that, you know, you're, you're going, you're realizing now, you know, they've, think bad's happened and you know that they're, they're you know they've they're like a their case has gone cold almost so you're then you find them in a cold environment is am i reading too much into it or you know is that a decision you know that you're thinking early on when you're location scouting this would be really good for this part of the script you know i'm intrigued to know things like that i think i think that you're not over reading it because it's such a phenomenal moment and that's why you're talking about it I don't think we think about, you know, the light per se in terms of going from one moment to the other, but about the meaning of going from one moment to the other, which is something that I think that this kind of moment is what makes the show very special and highly artistic. And I know it's these moments that Danny fought for, um, 
because they're not necessarily the information moment, you know, and sometimes TV is driven by just give them the information and go to the next moment, more information. And instead of that, you know, he fought for just the human moments. And I think that's what makes that, that moment very special. Yeah, I can't tell you how many times um, I was asked to cut the, the ice cream parlor scene. <laughs> and it was just over and over and over, kind of by everybody. Um, uh, not Patricia, obviously, because she totally got it. But um, it was just one of those things where it was never on the table for me to cut it. It just wasn't going to happen. So, so the, the constant asking, uh, because it, it just was, it was purely character driven um, mm -hmm. in, in the plot line, which is probably the least character driven plot line of the show, which is the investigation of the prosecutors. And so that's why it was so important to me because I do throw these character driven nuggets throughout their storyline uh, and to take them away uh, would just two dimensionalize them. Uh, and this was a particularly important one for me because it was after this horrible moment for them. And now they try to connect in a way that they, we don't see them connect in the show. Um, and, and it doesn't really work, right? There's not, you know, in, in sort of the, the triumphant moment uh, that you get is, is that they come together and they lost this, but they've, they've grown as partners in this way. And in this, they don't, they don't even grow as partners. And that's, that's why I liked it so much. And you know what, Danny? Everybody like interviews. They always ask me about this moment. Like this, <laughs> these are moments that matter. You know, yeah, at the end of the day. yeah. So well, uh, Danny, if if you have fifty people that barely know anything about the filmmaking process asking you the same question, then you know you're right. Yeah, yeah. No, then, totally. Uh, uh, but the, to the question of whether the color plays a role. That's where Danny plays a role. Is this a, is this a tragic moment? Yes, it's a tragic moment. Okay, how do we punctuate it? Oh, let's make it warm and cozy. Is this a good moment? Yes. Well, let's go opposite of the instinct. Let's make it a little cooler, a little rigid. They're like, they're fluorescent, they're horizontal and vertical. In the lines, there, there is not a warm place. It's a very sort of uh, Stalinist architecture. Well, it's not Stalinist, but it's sort of like a very cubist architecture. And you have put, and Patricia decide to put them in that place in the in the middle of the room with all these lines that don't make them be together. It's almost like they separate them. So when they together, it's even more powerful. When the, the scoop of ice cream tastes even better, as if they were under an umbrella at the beach. You know what I mean? Because they're celebrating in this sort of prison-looking place with whole verticals and horizontals. And the one scoop of ice cream that they don't even have because I think there's at the end of their ice cream uh, uh, gargantuan dinner, uh, it, it tastes better to the audience if you don't know it. I mean, those moments humanize, the, the little human moments, Danny, I mean, that's, that's the part of what kind of makes you invested as a, as a viewer, I think. Um, you know, one of the things that I've kind of taken away so far uh, uh, is that you see the plight of the addicts, you know, uh, how addictive, and I use the term addicts just because of, uh, that's, you know, that's how they're, you know, that's what they are, how they're portrayed. But essentially, I, I, I want to rephrase that, you know, you see the plight of people who become addicted and how hard it is. And you start to get an understanding of how, you know, there's such a tendency, you know, in life to go, it's not about the drug, it's about the addicts, make it about the addicts. And when you actually get an understanding, you, well, it's not so easy, you, you know, you can't just label somebody as an addict and then write them off. It's like, it's, a, it's, it's bloody hard, you know, and I, and I really found that moving. So I'm intrigued to know, you know, was that, was that a really important part of the show or did that just come out during the making of it? And, you know, no, it was part of the DNA of the show, you know, the term, um, addicts is actually seen as a derogatory term now because it's labeling them um, in a negative light as opposed to what they really have, which is an addiction issue. Or, or to be honest with you, in the case of opioids, it's a disease. And by an alcohol, you know, it's, it's literally uh, someone with opioid use disorder, their brain chemistry has been changed. And if they do not get opioids, 
uh, they go through in a, a pain that is so excruciating, they think they're going to die. And that is called being dope sick. That's where the, that's where the term dope sick comes from, right? So bringing a whole new understanding of addiction um, that in fact, these are people um, that have had their brain chemistry altered, their frontal lobe has been so damaged uh, that they cannot function um, without this drug, right? As opposed to the, the, the derogatory stereotype, which is that they're just losers and junkies that just want to get high. Um, and, and, and sort of giving a completely new understanding of, of that to people was a huge part of the show um, because it's A, the truth. <laughs> and also it, it was a huge part of Purdue's talking points for so many years, which was the drug is safe. It's the addicts that are abusing it who are the problem. Now, the cynicism of that is so staggering because they created these addicts by marketing a highly addictive drug is not addictive. So, so they create them, then they blame them for what they created. Now, if, 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 um, if Oxycontin wasn't so addict, as addictive as it was, why would addiction rates and overdose rates had started to increase 1996 on? <laughs> they wouldn't have, they just would have stayed the same if it was just quote, people getting high, right? Why, why all of a sudden do the percentages go, you know, start to grow in 1996, 1997, then as the drug becomes much more used, 1998, 1999, these addiction rates skyrocket in all the states, 45 of them that Purdue targeted. Um, and it's, it's, it's a really, it's a really staggering statistic. And by, by giving an understanding of what these people are actually going through, it can then lead to a path forward. Okay, so if they actually have a disease, if, if they have um, uh, a disorder uh, that has been caused by the change in their brain chemistry, okay, well, how can we now fix that? Because there have been so many uh, traditional solutions for addiction don't work for opioids. So, uh, so what can we do? And that was one of the biggest goals of the show that Beth Macy and I, you know, were really hoping Beth Macy's who wrote, she wrote the beautiful book Dope Sick and so much of her book covers people on the ground and it's really powerful and it's one of the few books that cover people on the ground in such detail, which is why it's probably one of the most successful uh, of, of the books um, on the opioid crisis, but it was that path forward was a major mission of the show. And in order to discuss this path forward, to discuss treatments, it required people to have a completely different understanding of how they view someone um, who have this disorder. So that's why um, people in that community, they actually don't use the term addicts, right? They use the term the addicted or mm -hmm. people with opioid use disorder um, because that it's a disorder, right? As opposed to a judgment on, on what they're going through. It's not a it's not a lifestyle, <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it it's isn't true to exact. yeah, well, it's not everyone, right? Like, like it's not a hundred percent of people got injured on the job and got addicted to Oxycontin. There are certainly, uh, you know, addiction issues as well that come from, they come from different, uh, they come from people, you know, a, a recreationally abusing the drug and then they become addicted. I'm not saying that does not happen, but what was so unique about Oxycontin is that it was, um, marketed and sold to doctors and patients is a safe opioid for pain issues that previously uh, you weren't supposed to take opioids for, but because they lied and said, well, this is safe, well, that opened up all the different ailments you could use this drug for because it was now safe, right? And, and what I just said is why we have the opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. That's how this all happened. Yeah, and I want to say two things. One is that Danny in this show really went beyond to always say the truth, you know, basing himself in every single fact, like everything was triple checked. Every, you know, all the information that the show is giving is 
super facts, and which I found very, very uh, uh, phenomenal, you know, that we can, we can see it knowing this is true. We're not making it up, okay? And then the other thing to just tell, you know, remind ourselves that this crisis has taken more than 500,000 people in this country. You know, this is bigger than, than COVID. This is for me the biggest tragedy of this country right now. And therefore the importance of, of making a show like Dope Sick and bringing it to the audience and bringing the attention and, uh, to, this, uh, to this discussion and hopefully fixing it because it's still happening and people are not aware of it. So it's just super important show. Also, just to add, the last thought about this is I'm not a religious person. I'm not an organized religious person, but if I were, I would trust my rabbi, my priest, my pastor, my muedin, you know, when he prays uh, facing Mecca. And I trust those people because that's how, what humanity is. You trust the elders, you trust those people, but I'm not a religious person in that sense, but I do trust my doctor. Because if I go to my doctor and I see a sign that says study it at whatever Yale, I don't know what, I'm like, okay. So the doctor comes and says, well, you have this and you need to take this pill. And I trust my doctor as I would trust my priest. I don't, but I, I trust my doctor. You most trusted person in life gave you something willingly or unknowingly and ignorantly. I, there are many cases that were people completely oblivious of that. And there were people that were knew it and had pill mills. Pill mills, you say it, I think, Danny. Yeah, pill mills is right. Yeah. And that guy that you trust and you go and you pay and you knock at the door and you wait for an hour and he hugs you like Dr. Phoenix did. That's the evil part. If the best of us were lied to and we gave it to all the people that died. And who gave it to me is knowingly because it's different. El Chapo Guzman and his friends bring in drugs to the border. You go at night to the corner, you buy a drug and you're in danger and police is going to get you. That's the risk you take. That's probably addiction too. And it's a different kind of addiction. There is an adventure in it and you get high, you take a pill. Oh my God, it's great. That's one thing. The other thing is your doctor gave it to you. That's his fault. It's the medical system fault. It's the people what they were supposed to check and balance is fault. And they all still have their, some of them, their houses in the Bahamas, unfortunately. But, but the truth is that is the tragedy. It's like your priest, your pastor, your rabbi. And that's, and it's a unique, I may be wrong, Danny, but it's a unique North American thing. It's a unique crisis for the United right. States. Yeah. It doesn't happen in Argentina. It doesn't happen in Australia. Other horrible things happen in Syria, for Christ's sake. But this doesn't happen anywhere else. It only happens here. Here. In the name of greed, in the name of dollar sign, and in the name of unregulated market economy. I just made my political statement. Sorry. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, I, I think it's about a very valid point. I mean, this, I mean, that's, uh, you wouldn't even know. I mean, I wouldn't have even known any of this if it hadn't been for this show. I mean, and there's some of this, there's some of us that read that spend a lot of time reading the news and research things. And there's some of us that, that, you know, that don't and uh, that kind of get our information from, from shows, whether they're factual or not. And I would imagine that on this show, we're hearing that it's all factual. I don't know how much of the characters were based on real characters. I mean, I know some of them, I'm sure Dr. Phoenix was a created character based on stories that you'd heard. Yeah, but, and, and what's up? That's accurate. Yeah. He's, he's based on, three different doctors um but then the more i read the more i realized there's a hundred dr phoenixes out there if, if if not more um but, but my, my my point was is that you you just wouldn't you wouldn't know and i didn't know and I, of course i was aware of this of the of the opioid crisis but i didn't know quite how it, the depth of how it you know how it came about Matthew, and, Phoenix is, is created and Betsy is too, but the two prosecutors are real. The DEA agent, I think, is real. Of course, the family. Oh, she's, a, uh, she's a composite. The, the DEA is a composite. But the, the prosecutors the, are and the Sacklers are, and there are other characters that pop in and out that are. 
Mm-hmm. So this, the Sack, I just read that the Sackler family just something was just passed that meant that they weren't able to be protected by the bankruptcy court. Is that right? Is that a very recent thing that it? Uh, no, no, no. They were trying to pass the Sackler Act in Congress um, uh, to to not allow the type of uh, protections that they're getting, I which see. is that that the company filed bankruptcy and the Sacklers are 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 basically being shielded behind the company's bankruptcy filing uh, from future litigation, even though they themselves have not filed for bankruptcy. So it's almost uh, it's almost like a loophole that they were able to game. Uh, and, and that's all they do. Um, they game the system. I mean, one thing I've been quoted as saying is, is they always win. Uh, the Sacklers always win. They always get away with it, even when they don't. They've pled guilty. The company has produced pled guilty to three felonies and nine billion dollars in fines. Okay, this is a criminal organization. It is a criminal company. They've pled guilty to three felonies and nine billion dollars in fines. They were micromanaged by the Sackler family, uh, and yet the Sackler family themselves haven't faced any individual repercussions. Uh, and our show is is one of the moments where those repercussions might have happened. And then you see in the last two episodes how it slips away. And, and how it does slip away ties into institutional failures uh, of the United States government. That's where the show gets, you know, really profound in what it has to say about America is, is you know, we're following this criminal company, Purdue Pharma, and it's perfectly terrifying and exciting as, as a piece of drama. But, but one of the reasons why I was so excited about pursuing the story besides exposing these crimes is how it elevates and it intersects at the highest levels of the Justice Department, the highest levels of the FDA, the highest levels of Congress, um, the highest levels of the DEA. Uh, and, and the fact that they're able to influence those, those institutions that are there to protect us and how they're able to influence them uh, has some very dark things to say about, about our own government institutions that I bet Cheka would probably agree with. Mm -hmm. I do. <laughs> <laughs> Patricia as well, Patricia as well. Well said, Danny. Thank well you. Said. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Matthew, you started talking about, you know, having a moment of silence for COVID and, you know, immediately I'm thinking, you know, we're here showing you guys dope sick. I mean, we should have a minute of silence every day for all these, you know, victims, all the victims. They just giving, you know, putting in the bodies, the American people. It is not fair. It's very sad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, Danny, Danny, sorry. No, no, no. Danny said something the other day to me that sort of reminded me of the times when I was a news cameraman and, and, and people with the desaparecidos, the disappearance in Argentina, Chile, and they were saying, I need closure. You know, I need closure. I, I, somehow I need closure. And Danny was saying that there is a hope that the show will give closure to some of these tragedies, or at least will give hope of closure to some of these tragedies. And by watching the show, I haven't watched it as an audience. I watched it as a cinematographer and color correcting. I think you were right, Danny. I think there, there is some closure. Um, and the closure is that the people who did dope sick, and we all work on it, and everyone that worked on it, we want some closure. You know, we want to give the victim some closure. And I think you're right. You know, I hope that's the case. Well, yeah, I mean, I've seen it on Twitter. It's been amazing seeing the response to the show on Twitter. It's been as passionate as anything I've ever worked on. Um, and uh, I've been over and over, I've been seeing people saying, oh, now I understand what happened to my son or my daughter or me. Uh, I'm seeing that over and over again and, and feeling just um, grateful to, to, to realize that they're a part of a bigger story. Mm -hmm. um, and that, and you know, Beth Macy has this quote she loves to say about how someone uh, after reading her book, Dope Sick, thanked her and said, 
I never knew I was part of a bigger story. I just thought I was a fuck up. Mm. So for them to have this understanding of no, there was a much grander context here that goes to the highest levels of the US government that goes to the darkest corners of American capitalism uh, is, is profound for people. And that's another part of, of the healing process, but also part of people that are still struggling with this issue, um, which there are so many, uh, for them to have this understanding and for their loved ones to have this understanding um, could also, I think, not only be therapeutic Beyond, for them, but, you know, but once again, help them find a, level, a path forward you know, to, to, to I don't find think, ways you know, to get out of it. You know, I hope you guys all win awards, but, you know, in, in, the, in the making of the show and to recognize what you've done. But I think you almost don't, you know, don't need to because, you know, just by hearing these responses, you know, you've, you've brought this to light, this problem to light. And, you know, you, getting those kind of responses, you know, you've, you've touched the people that it's, that it's hit hardest the most. And that is, for that, you've done a great service, all of you, you know, for being involved in a show like this. And that's the power of filmmaking, you know, when it's done correctly um, with the right people at the, at the helm. So thank you all for that. I um, hope everyone goes to watch it and tells people about it, because I think the more people that see this show, the more of a conscious we're going to create in the country of a problem that is still happening today. Like I'm showing this show to my 14 year old daughter because I want to make sure that she knows of the existence of this shit that's out there and that can be given to her by anybody, including her best friend and her doctor. And so just spread the word, I guess, for the good of the country. Thank you once again for listening to and watching today's roundtable and make sure that you watch the series Dope Sick. It's streaming now on Hulu. There's still a few episodes left to stream and uh, it'll change your lives in a positive way for watching it. I'd also like to thank the rest of the film roundtable team as always. Uh, Erin Weil, Doug Torres, Maria Prieto and Jimena Prieto for making the film roundtable possible. And don't forget lastly to like and subscribe to our YouTube channel, our podcasts, so we can continue to deliver great and valuable work for you guys to enjoy and learn from. I no think problem. it's great, great ending. <laughs> Thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Matthew. Bye. 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 Take care.